welcome back everybody. I want to make sure that Dana has her full amount of time today. Since our time is precious. Hi, Francie. Um, good to be back with you all. With this is our um, second to last week of our Amos study, and I'm looking forward to it. We have some 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 of the weird stuff in Amos. It all feels a little weird, but we get the extra weird stuff that I'm excited for Dana <laughs> to clear up for us today. Uh, so I will pray, and then we'll turn it over to Dana. Many, I'm assuming you all know Dr. Dana, Dr. Dana Harris. I'll say it for the recording. Dana has been part of Redeemer a very long time and has been a wonderful teacher most of that time, I imagine, and teaches at, teaches at Trinity. I mean, you've been a wonderful teacher. <laughs> we get it, America. I was wondering about that, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, I don't know when you started teaching in the context of Redeemer, but all of it that I've heard has been wonderful. So let me pray. <laughs> like nice <me>. save. <laughs> Oh, Father, thank you for this glorious day in the sunshine. Thank you for your word. That um, is another way you reveal yourself to us, the main, the main way. We pray that today we would know you through your word and through the sunshine as well. Come, Lord Jesus, and bless our, bless our sister Dana and us in, in the hearing. We thank you, and in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I'm hoping to be able to share my screen. So let's just get that all set up. And let's see. Um, okay. Uh, why am Okay, sorry, it's saying that I need to. Uh, okay. Hang on. I'm sorry, I had this all set up and it's never been a problem, but that's technology. Yeah. So that's, I just need to get into some preferences. Um, okay. So hopefully now I can share my screen. I just gave myself that permission. That's kind of weird that I have to do that. Um, let's see. Okay. You guys, I'm really sorry. I can't. Um, Amanda, can I email you this? I don't know of another way to do it. No problem. Um, I, just, I don't want to waste time and I've got this all set up and for some reason it's not um, working. Nope. I can get started without it, but um, I, it won't let me share my screen. So I will have to do a way around it here. Um, yeah, I had it all queued up and ready to go. So don't know what's going on with that. But How frustrating for you. Dana. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sending it to Amanda. And if you don't mind, Amanda, just um, I can tell you when to advance the screen. Yep. But I'm so sorry. I just don't know what else to do. It's been one of those days. My computer wouldn't print to the printer over here either. So. Did you get it? Great. Thank goodness we can do this so quickly, but I um, hate to put Amanda on the fly on the you know on the spot, but I just don't want to um, waste too much time on this. And I think there's a lot of material here, so I really want to make sure that the PowerPoints will really help to kind of clarify. And I'm wanting to just focus on a few things because it's just kind of an overwhelming passage. So while that's getting set up, um, I will just go ahead and get us started. So I'm going to be doing Amos 7 and 8, and there's actually a series of, um, and when we have the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see this, but there's a series of five visions. I'm just covering four, and they're in pairs. So vision one and two are a pair, and then vision three and four are a pair, but after each of those visions, there's a, here we go. Okay, great. So um, thank you so much, Amanda. I'm so glad that you can just, so you can go to the next uh, slide, slide two. Okay, so here is a little bit small font, sorry about that, but here's kind of the, the big picture. And in the first pair, and I see that there's a, a mistake that I didn't catch, so I'm, I'm sorry, but you'll see it. <clears throat> in the first pair, um, Amos intercedes and God relents. So that's the first and second vision. And then expansion should go into the third vision. That was a mistake I caught later on, but no worries. Um, so then we have the second pair of visions, and that's going to be the third vision and expansion, the fourth vision and expansion. And then next week, Amanda will give us um, the fifth 
vision. So let me just make a few comments about this because in Amos 1 and 2, we have the oracles that were directed against the nations. And then in Amos 3 and 4, there's the exposure of Israel's sin. And then in Amos 5 and 6 that we saw last week, there is this lament over the impending death of Israel. So um, there's a lot of, it, here in chapter 7 and 8, there are a lot of illusions that take us back. So if you're feeling like deja vu, I get it because there's gonna be a lot of things that we've heard before that are now kind of being re, uh, kind of realigned and put together. And uh, in the, just one other thing that I'll say in the second pair, notice there's gonna be a difference. In the first pair, Amos intercedes and God relents. In the second, in the second pair, which is visions three and four, God just, inter, he just initiates, he just works. And part of that is to show that judgment is imminent. It's going to come. And so there's no, you know, there's there's no dodging that. Um, and I also want to just say that Amanda has talked about this strange imagery here, but I have to laugh. You know, I spent so much time in Revelation and some of Jewish apocalyptic. This seems pretty tame. But really what the visions are is they're going to be images that are very powerful to try to get people's attention. So that's one way to think about it. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so here, I just want you to kind of see, again, uh, that expansion shouldn't be that. I don't, I don't even know what happened because I did change this so well. You know what? There's no perfection this side of heaven. Hallelujah. Anyway, so we're just focusing on the first pair, the first and second vision. And actually, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so this is the first vision of the first pair. And as I said, each one is going to have this horrific disaster which is the, the vision that Amos sees is something that's just horrible. But Amos is gonna pray, and these are short little prayers, and God relents. So let's just look at this one. Um, so this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing a swarm of locusts after the king's share had been harvested, and just as the late crops were coming up. When they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob uh, survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. Now, this is really, really interesting because um, in earlier in chapter six, there was a prediction of an invading army. And so one could think that the, lor the locust swarm could be an invading army. That's a common image. But actually, we're going to see that this is actually meaning an actual swarm of lo locusts. And if we go back to Deuteronomy 28, a swarm of locusts would be one of the curses that would happen to Israel if they, for, um, if they went away from God's covenant. So it's, you're starting to see some connections even within the Old Testament. And notice it says after the king's share had been harvested. So what this probably says is that there were two harvests and the king and his whole entourage got the first harvest. And that would feed them and all of the uh, ranking people, but also their livestock. So if this comes after, that means the locust is going for the second harvest, which would be the harvest that the people would use. What this is actually saying is that this is going to be starvation. This is basically going to lead to people's starvation. Now, I want to just give us some visual imagery here. I don't know if you have ever experienced a locust swarm, but Amanda, if you could do the next slide. These are gonna be blurry pictures, sorry, but this is an actual picture of a swarm of locusts. And if you can do the next slide, uh, this one I thought, I mean, look, it just blanks out the sun, how many locusts there are. And then if you can do the next slide. Um, and this just shows the result that the land is stripped clean. So this is a really horrific um, image. And interestingly, the same imagery is used in the plagues in Egypt. So this is severe judgment that's being rendered here. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, so I wanna put your attention on verse two. And it says, I cried out sovereign Lord, forgive. And I, I kind of feel like these are, these are like Amos's breath prayers. You know, this, this is not a long petition before the Lord. And sometimes we have the prophets will, you know, recite God's faithfulness and then they'll give like a, a reciting of the history of Israel and how God has intervened. 
There's none of that. This is raw. This is absolutely raw. Forgive. It's like Amos sees this and he's like, he has nothing else to do but to fall upon the Lord's mercy. Um, it's also interesting. There's some things here. Why he mentions Jacob instead of Israel, because this whole thing is being directed to Israel. So why Jacob? And one possibility is that it's putting the focus on the individual within the nation and not just the nation. So it's really a, a cry, a raw cry to God's mercy. And then the thing about how he's so small, and there's a little bit of irony in this. Um, on the one hand, Israel was not completely small at this point in time, although it was certainly smaller than Egypt and some of the surrounding empires. But I think the irony is that in comparison to what God is doing, Israel is, Jacob is so small. And that's really ironic because they thought they were so big. So I really think there's kind of irony that's at play here. But even so, look at, he says, you know, there's kind of, uh, he relents. God says, okay, I, I hear you. That doesn't mean that um, God is going to, spare them any judgment. It's really more of a delay. And what's so interesting is that God turns in compassion. And sometimes people have a hard time thinking about God changing his mind, but God is responsive to his people. He cares about his people. And this raw cry from Amos directs the heart of God. But interestingly, the people don't turn from their sins. And so it's, it's a kind of an unequal equation. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity to live stream uh, the memorial service for, for Pasty, Pastor Harry Stackhouse. I don't know if any of you know him, but he was the pastor at Sign of the Dove in Waukegan, a man of unbelievable faithfulness to the Lord. But in the tributes, one person who was kind of like his spiritual son said this, and I think it captures what's happening in this passage very well. This person said, there were times when I didn't act like a spiritual son, but Pastor Harry never stopped being a spiritual father. And I really love that because I think that captures that the people have stopped being God's people, but he hasn't stopped being their God. And so there's really a lot of, of compassion in this. Okay, so let's go ahead to um, the next slide. And I, won't necessarily read through all of this again, but I'm just gonna highlight a few things. Notice that now the judgment is going to be fire. And this is a tremendous fire. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, again, some imagery here. These are pictures of massive fires, um, probably linked to drought. So I will liken this. I always tell people, if you grew up in California, you have a certain edge on biblical interpretation because I grew up in San Diego and we had no rain from March or April until September or October. And as you know, every year about September, California has these massive fires. And that's because the land is so parched that it doesn't take anything for a fire to start. Um, but interestingly in this image, and you can go to the next slide, uh, in this image, it says that even the great deep was dried up which suggests that the fire is so intense that sources of water are, are dried up. So again, this is just horrific imagery. And again, notice the short little prayer. I beg you, stop. I mean, Amos sees how devastating this is going to be. And again, God relents. And we've already kind of worked through some of these other things. So what really hits me is God's compassion in the midst of these staggering uh, visions. But this is the last time These, this first pair of visions show that God relents in response to Amos's cry, but that's not going to happen again. Um, so there's a, this is really stressing the inevitability of the judgment. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, okay. So now we're going to get into the second pair. And again, this is going to be a vision and an expansion, and then we're going to get a vision and an expansion. So now we have an image, and again, I won't read through all of this, but we have now an image of a plumb line, and notice the pattern here. God says to Amos, what do you see? And Amos replies. I don't think this is a 
literal plumb line. In fact, it might even be something altogether different. And I'll talk about that. But God is showing Amos something and asking him, what do you see? And then the Lord says, this is what I'm going to do. So notice how different this vision is. No crying out by Amos. The Lord just is, now he is initiating and he is moving. And this is an indication that there's going to be a tremendous judgment. Now, what's interesting is that just about every single English version says plumb line. And if you're trying to remember what a plumb line is, um, I haven't built a brick wall recently, but if you build a brick wall, you want to make sure that it's true, that it's straight. So you tie a heavy object on the end of a string and you hold it. And that, of course, because of gravity is going to be perfectly vertical. And then you want to see if your wall aligns to that. So that's a plumb line. So if that's what's going on here, that would be an indication that God has a standard and he is now judging his people according to that standard. And of course, that would be the standard that's revealed in the Mosaic law. But there's a minority view, and I'm actually a little bit persuaded by this, and I won't get into all the Hebrew here, but that actually what's the words, because the two words that I'm plumb line and tin, the metal tin, are very, very closely related. And I won't, again, go into the Hebrew, but there's ways that uh, later on people added points to indicate the vowels and at this point in the text it's uncertain so i'm going to go with the minority view um which is followed even by the our guest speaker last week dr danny carroll that actually what's in view here is 10 so it'd be something like this the lord was standing by the wall that had been built with 10 and he had 10 in his hands and he says to amos what do you see 10 now, why would 10 make a difference? And if you can go to the next slide, that would be um, helpful. Okay, um, this is 10, okay? Those are 10 cans. It's really easy to crush 10 cans. The picture from the Handyman website shows a, a pair of shears cutting right through a sheet of 10. So what's the point here? 10 is really weak. It's not like bronze. You can't do this with bronze. And really, I think what's happening is that metal gives the appearance of strength. So what the Lord is saying to the people is, you think that your walls are fortified with metal and therefore they're strong. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Your walls, your defenses, your fortifications, your false confidence is as weak as tin. And when the invading armies come, those walls will not hold. And I think that interpretation is a lot more in line with what's going on in Amos. That they're, what they've put their confidence in is, is an illusion. It's not real. And that really goes with a lot of the boasting that we're gonna see that they have is that they're so confident in their uh, ability to do things with impunity, with their fortresses. And God is exposing all of that. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so this takes us back just to the, the uh, same text. But again, I think the, the 10 comment makes better sense here. But a few things I want to point out, if you can see kind of in the middle of the screen, my people. So even in the midst of this judgment, there's still that merciful cry, my people. God has not rejected his people, even if they're going to undergo severe judgment. Um, and then just to comment about the last verse there, verse nine, it says the high places, the sanctuaries. And there's a lot of discussion on this. Does this mean completely pagan deities? And I think Dr. Carroll made a really good point last week where he's saying probably not. This is the false worship of Yahweh. So they have the right God but they have the wrong worship. And I think that's much more compelling. Um, again, a little bit of archeology span here, but in Samaria, which would be part of the Northern Kingdom, at a uh, excavation, and they found a broken piece of pottery. And on it, it said, to Yahweh and his Asherah, his consort. Okay, well, if we know what scripture says, God does not have a consort. And her name is not Asherah. 
But we can see in a lot of archaeological evidence that the Northern Kingdom was conflating. They were taking Yahweh and then adding in their own cultural practices, their own ideologies. And that's what I think really makes sense here is God is calling them out on that and saying, I am the true God worthy of true worship. You cannot remake me in your image. And I think that's really what the people are doing. So we've gone through three visions very quickly. Let me just stop and ask if there's some questions um, that you might have. Okay, I'm not hearing anything or seeing anything, so I'll just blast on through. Um, now we're gonna take a, a break from the visions. So if you can go to the next slide and we're going to get an expansion and this expansion is um, going to kind of it's like a historical interlude and it actually helps us to understand something about the visions so uh it's kind of interesting this is in the third person but i think there's every good reason to believe that amos wrote this so here's another in thing that's very interesting about prophets is not only do they record the visions that god gave them but they also record the historical context around those visions now this is you can see that it's verses 10 to 17 but i've broken it up into smaller uh, uh kind of chunks and what's really interesting is amazon i mean amaziah is the uh priest in bethel Bethel is the alternative and one might even say counterfeit place of worship because the true temple was in Jerusalem. So this is a counter uh, temple and he has a message for Amos. OK, um, and what he's I mean, sorry, he has a mes message to the king from Amos and notice how he phrases Amos's words. It's basically a conspiracy theory. I thought I'd choose language that we can relate to, okay? Instead of taking to heart what Amos is saying that God is going to bring judgment, the priest reports to the king, hey, there's this conspiracy. He's come up here to preach this conspiracy. The land cannot bear his words. And so he goes on to say, Jeroboam will die by the sword. Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Well, nobody wants to hear that prophecy. <laughs> nobody wants to hear about judgment. So rather than take to heart the very words of God, the priest, who is the person who's supposed to represent the people to God and God to the people, now distorts the word of God in a very profound way. Um, we're going to find, though, that eventually this is exactly what happens. Um, Jeroboam doesn't die by the sword himself, but his dynasty does. So Jeroboam dies a natural cause, but his son is assassinated. And with that, that's going to be the end of the Jeroboam line. Um, it shows, I think, just this whole idea that the priest is distorting the word of God, how profoundly the religious institution has fallen. And uh, we're going to see this even more profoundly in the next couple of slides. So let me just uh, go ahead and go to the next slide then. And so now Amaziah uh, comes back and he's going to report to Amos and he says, get out, you seer. Go back to the land and earn your bread. That's a reference to professional prophets. Um, don't prophesy anymore here because, and this is really key, this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. And once again, this really underscores, first of all, Amaziah completely rejects the prophet from God, but notice he doesn't mention Yahweh anywhere in these verses. It's the king's sanctuary, the temple of the kingdom. These phrases don't occur anywhere else in the Old Testament. And what they're actually showing is even if the people worship Yahweh, what's primary is the king. This is showing very, very clearly that this is ultimately about the king and his kingdom, not God's kingdom. So a lot, this is something that Dr. Carroll talked about last week, but a lot of what this passage is doing is exposing counterfeit narratives, exposing um, repackaging God in terms that are um, would advance the, the, in this case, Jeroboam's own agenda. So instead of conforming 
his rule to God, the true God, he is taking the true God and conforming him to his own agenda. And that's what Amos is calling out. God will not allow his people to redefine him in their own terms for their own advancement and profit. Um, okay, so let's go ahead to the next one. And I, I kind of love this. I paraphrase verse 14 of, hey, it was, this is Amos saying, hey, it wasn't my idea to be a prophet, okay? Um, you know, don't, don't blame me. I, I, this wasn't my idea. But what this is really showing is, you know, he was a taking care of a shepherd and he was taking care of his sycamore trees. And God said, hey, go prophesy to my people Israel. So it shows really that, again, Amos is not a professional prophet. He's not one who's been called to be a prophet his whole life. And in some respects, this even shows it's more of a sting to the northern kingdom. God sends somebody who isn't even a prophet, and he's a foreigner, to go indict the northern kingdom by how far they have come. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you could almost hear the people in the north saying, hey, at least you could have sent us one of your top flight prophets. But no, we get this guy. But that's, again, showing that God will raise up an individual at a particular point in time to give his word. He's, he's not limited in any way, um, shape, or form. Um, okay, and then it goes on to, again, just notice this. Do not prophesy. Stop preaching. That's actually really scary because now we're getting to a point where the people are not even allowing any way for God's word to come in and help them. There's, there's like, they're cutting off all possible ways that they could possibly repent. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next part. And this, I have to say, is probably one of the hardest sections. This is the prophecy against Amaziah himself, and it's hard. It's really hard. Um, he says about his Amazon, Amaziah's wife that she will become a prostitute in the city. That could mean either or both um, some kind of sexual violence, including rape by invading forces, or it could mean that when she, her children and her husband are taken from her, that she is left and, and has to resort to prostitution. But it's a horrific image, no matter what. Your sons and daughters will die by the sword. This was a common military practice to make sure that there was no heir in the line. So, I mean, it's, it's horrific, but often little children were killed because they would be an impediment to moving people. But even older children or even young adults could be killed because they would, you want to cut off the line of that person. So this is, this is horrifying. Um, your land will be measured up and divided. Normally, priests didn't own land. So the fact that Amaziah has land probably suggests that he was really loyal to the king. And so this suggests a certain level of corruption, but even that will be divided up. Um, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, meaning the priest will be die and presumably be buried in an unclean land. He will be defiled forever. And this is, this is horrible. This is just a horrible prophecy. And Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Now, what's interesting to me is that these are hard passages. And I've been working a lot in my, some other research on violence and revelation. On the one hand, we can look at this and we can say God is justified in this violence because it shows the horrific nature of the sin. And to a certain extent, I think that's true. I mean, in a large way, God's judgment reveals his holiness, reveals his justice. But I think rather than looking at this, well, let me say it this way. Another way that we can look at this is this horrific judgment actually gives us a window into how bad the sin was. I mean, ultimately, know that we know that God pays the price for sin on the cross with Jesus. And that's how far God is willing to go to bring about his justice, to, to suffer on the cross. But when we see these horrific judgments, um, they're kind of the mirror to how bad the sin was. Because we already saw that in the first two visions, God was willing to relent, that God is merciful. So when we get to these visions, I think what's really key is to realize there is a point in which God's justice demands this kind of judgment. And that's hard. 
that's that's hard because the images here are so horrific. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, here's another vision. This is our fourth and final vision, and it's paired. So it's going to be like the vision that we just saw. What do you see? I see a basket of ripe fruit. Okay. The time is ripe for my people. I will spare them no longer. Um, so again, this is uh, really powerful to have this image, to have this vision here, and to really see that you know, it's, it's, the contrast is, is staggering. I mean, one of the best things about the end of the summer is all that ripe fruit, right? It's something that we like, it's a positive image, but here it's being presented as really the image of harvest for judgment. The time is ripe for God's judgment. So it's a pretty staggering uh, image that's being given to us. Um, notice also, these are pretty short little sentences. So particularly in that last part, let me just talk about this, but um, in that day, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but the songs we turn to wailing, many, many bodies flung everywhere, silence. This is just horrifying. And notice how it's a shocking uh, progression from singing to wailing to silence. You, you can just feel it. This is very, very heavy. Um, so this is the fourth and final vision that we're going to talk about. There's another vision that Amanda is going to take care of next week. But let's go ahead now and work through the expansion. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this expands out. And what this is basically going to do is, I think, give the, the explanation for why the judgment is so severe. Okay, so it says, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. And the idea of doing away probably suggests that they're so, the exploitation of the poor is so bad that they will eventually kill all those people. Um, I mean, literally work them to death. And so that's probably the implication. But listen how, this is just horrific judgment. He says, you know, when the, the people are in a celebration, which should be putting their focus on God, the true God. The, new, the celebration of the new moon, that's a monthly celebration. Um, the Sabbath, that's a weekly celebration. On the Sabbath, you're supposed to cease all work so that you can focus on worshiping God. It's a reorientation, just like our liturgy is. It refocuses us. But instead, what are the people doing? You know, it's like they're checking their cell phones every five seconds to, when is this going to be over so we can get back to the market? Come on, come on, come on which goes back to what Dr. Carroll talked about last week, that their, their religion is perfunctory. They're going through the motions, but there's no heart in this at all. It's like, just get on with it. Come on, can we get out of church so we can go back and check the stock market? And actually it's worse than that because they go back and they say, basically they're saying, well, when can we get over with the religious stuff so that we can go back to the exploitation? That's really what they're saying. Um, in Dr. Carroll's commentary, he just had a line that I, I literally could not resist quoting because if you like alliteration, this is great, but he describes this, the machinations in the marketplace that led to so much misery. I mean, I just think that's great with all those M's there, but that's really what he's talking about. Now, if you look at this list, I, I'm gonna go through it rather quickly, but. These are the charges against the, the leadership in Israel. I think the first, um, the ones that are skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, so these are all corrupt practices to make the, the seller get more profit. But really what's horrifying is verse six, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. What this is talking about is um, not only debt slavery, where people have to go into debt because they're so poor, but it's actually talking about um, for such a small price, for such a small amount. So we talked about this previously in one of our studies. It's kind of like a payday loan. You might have an original loan of $100, but you get end up getting into a debt that's thousands of dollars because of these exorbitant interest rates. And that's really kind of the idea that's there. And the last line, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. 
that meant that they were mixing in the chaff, which should have been swept away with the good grain. So not only are they using dishonest scales, but they're selling an impure product. So it's exploitation at every possible level. Okay, we'll go through the next quickly and then I wanna leave um, some questions, time for a little bit of questions here. Okay, so again, the Lord has said by the pride of Jacob, and I'm taking this as ironic, you know, that they are the pride of Jacob. And Lord, the Lord is using this really in an ironic, almost sarcastic way. I will never forget anything that they have done. This is a tremendous encouragement for those who are being exploited, that God does not forget that sin, that God does not turn a blind eye to what happens that is completely unjust and dishonest. And then the next image we hear is really of a horrific earthquake that's implied and a terrible, terrible flood. What strikes me about this verse is that it shows that even creation is affected by the sin of humanity. And a verse that I want to just call our attention to is Romans 8, verses 19 to 21. I'll read it, and then I'll repeat that reference. For the creation waits in the eager expectation of the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. And that's Romans 8, verses 19 to 21. So I think there's a hint of that here, that even creation is affected by the sin of the people. Okay, the next slide. In that day, I said I'd come back to this, but this is the day of judgment. And so the day of Yahweh's, it's a very prominent theme. But notice here, we're gonna get, you know, just almost a reversal of creation. I'll make the sun go down at noon and darken. I mean, this could refer to a solar eclipse. That's, a, that's entirely possible. But notice what he's gonna do is all of their festivals, the things that they were so flippant about are now gonna be sources of mourning. So there's weeping, sackcloth, shaving the heads. I'll make it like the time of the morning for the only son. In Israel at this time, the firstborn son was the lifeblood of the family. And if the firstborn son dies, that's the end of the family. So this is profound mourning, a bitter day. And we can go to the next couple of verses. Then now we're gonna have a famine. But this is not a famine of food, which has been previously talked about. Now this is going to be a famine of the word of God. And in many respects, this is far more horrifying than a physical famine. To be without the word of God, you can see the people are staggering. They, they are absolutely without any direction. They're cut loose from their moorings. And there's all kinds of ways that we can talk about that. They're cut loose in their moorings to sin more, to, to be completely cut off from any access to truth. And again, a very, very powerful image. Um, and then finally, if we can go to the last slide, and then I want to open it up a little bit. Um, and then in that day, the lovely young women, the strong men will faint. So he's showing how horrific this is because the strongest in the population, the young people, are the very ones who are gonna be fainting from thirst. In other words, the implication, if it's bad for the young ones, how bad is it gonna be for everyone else? So this is kind of hyperbolic language. Okay, then it goes on to say, those who swear by the sin of Samaria, uh, your God, Dan, um, and then the God of Beersheba. And again, we could unpack all of these, but the point that I wanna leave us with and just a few possible ways that we could think about this in our uh, contemporary context, is all of these are references to worshiping Yahweh, but in a way that combines things from the surrounding culture. And I want to just be very careful how I say this, but uh, the image that kept coming to my mind when I was going through this was really the image of January 6th and the Capitol riots. And this, the image that was so terrifying for me there were the signs, the flags that said Jesus saves right next to the, the, the flags for Trump. Now, the caveat I wanna make is 
people voted for Trump sometimes out of a conviction in their heart that he was the right person. And I'm not even touching on who voted for whom. What I really wanna focus on is the imagery on January 6th where you got the conflation by at least some people that Jesus and Trump were pretty much on the same level and Jesus is now being brought into the service of an ideology that is contrary to God. So I wanna be very specific. I'm focusing on that group. And I think that's a contemporary picture of what Amos is saying, that this is a group of people who have taken the true God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and brought him into service of their ideology. I will never forget that image because it was so clearly embedded in my brain. Another way we could think about this would be the prosperity gospel where we've taken the true God and we've now said that this God, if we do X, Y, Z, this God will bless us and we'll have multiple cars and big houses and jets and all these kinds of things. That's what Amos is talking about. He's talking about not going off and, and worshiping some pagan God, but taking the true God and now reconfiguring, reconstructing that God in the images and the ideologies and the expectations of the day, of one's own society, one's own background. So I wanna just kind of leave it with that. This is a heavy passage. I know it's a heavy passage. I think we've got just a few minutes for questions. Um, I, I wanna give us a word of encouragement in a minute, but before that, it's not a bad thing to sit in the heaviness. It's really not. I mean, this has been a hard week in our country. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the murders in Atlanta, but they have been tied in some respect to some teaching. And again, you know, it's, there's teaching in church that somebody can pervert, but kind of that focus on um, the purity culture and not allowing people to really understand what sexuality is meant by from God, but to see it as purely evil. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think we're being challenged to think about what are the ways that the true God is being distorted in the teaching of the church? And I'm using that term very broadly, the church. But I think it's a time of serious reflection and deep repentance. Um, you know, ultimately God wins, God prevails, his kingdom advances. But I, this passage is really made me realize it's, it's good to be self-reflective. It's good for the church to stop and think, are we truly presenting the true God as he presents himself? Or have we allowed things to distort that image of the true God according to our own ideologies and goals? So I'm gonna leave it there and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Amanda, so much for being so flexible. Thanks, Dana. That was really illuminating. Um, Brian and I are always talking about what the role of government is and what the role of the church is in um, like all of the, we see a lot of this exploitation today. We just don't know like whose job it is <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> So what does it look like when the church is actually addressing exploitative labor practices? And um, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, I think that's a good one. Um, there's a couple of things. I think we need to take clearly that we're not a theocracy. So we're not kind of a nation that is under the old covenant under God. Um, we are a representative government, which I take very seriously. That means we have access to elected officials. We can do things that can try to change policies. So I, I take that very seriously. We can write to senators, we can write to congressmen and women. We can, we can try to be about uh, changing things that are unfair or even putting laws in practice. I mean, so like child labor laws, you know, that the, actually those were driven in large part by Christians who saw that the exploitation of children was horrific. And so child labor laws are, you know, a result of that. So the fact that we're in a representative government, I take very seriously. 
Um, but I also think that there's a role of the church to have a prophetic voice. And I think part of what the church does is to bring these things into the light. Um, a lot of people don't know about exploitative practices, particularly like in the production of clothing. That's, that's a really big one. But there's been a lot of exposure of that. Um, you know, again, just touching on things that are maybe in the news, but, you know, Amazon is under fire right now for some of their labor practices. So I think that the church does have a prophetic role in calling out those things and bringing them into the light. Um, so I would say it's kind of twofold. You know, we, the, the church is not the government. And I think that's where you get problems is when you get those things conflated. But we are, as, as citizens, and there's different nationalities represented here, but we're all in citizens of countries that have representation, then we are really, I think, called to be aware um, to, you know, to sign petitions, to do the kinds of things that we can do to, that, that speak to injustice, um, and also to call it out, to, to make it visible. Because evil flourishes when it's in silence, when it's in darkness. And I think a lot of what the church can do is to bring those things into the light. Um, that, that, those are my first thoughts. It's really helpful. It was a good question. And I appreciate your point about even about um, bringing it into the light as people of the light. Um, I would love to keep going, but <clears throat> we need to wrap it up. Thank you, Dana. That was really powerful. And I, I, I learned a lot. There's one point where I don't know if you can see, I was just like going like, <laughs> going like this, like, Lord, oh, you're big and you will not allow your name to be tarnished. And um, may it be so with us. Can I say one final thing, um, just as a word of encouragement, because I think we kind of need that. This is a hard passage, okay? I mean, it was hard. It was heavy working on it. I found myself just like doing that same thing, you know, kind of throwing my hands up and had to go for a walk yesterday just to clear my brain. Um, but I want to just say like, let's be encouraged by the lament psalms. And in the lament psalms, God's people are invited to lament. We have a lot to lament. I mean, I, I look at the news headlines and I lament. And that's right. We should let our hearts be broken by those things. But in the lament psalms, once the psalmist has, got, has lamented those things, the spirit of God brings him back to a right understanding that God is sovereign mm -hmm. and God is just. And almost all of the lament psalms end in praise, not a praise that refuses to look, but a praise that goes through the lament and comes out to the realization that Praise God, my hope is Jesus. <laughs> That's paraphrased. The psalm doesn't say that. But just to, to reorient us back to the sovereignty, the goodness, the justice, the holiness of God. Amen. Amen. Lord, may it be so. Thank you. We lament. We praise. Um, do your work in us. And thank you. Bless Dana and all of us as we continue to worship together in a few minutes. In your name, in your holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dana. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dana. That was wonderful. All right. Yeah, thank you all. You made it through. Two of the hardest chapters in Lumet and Amos. <laughs> Next week, only one chapter. So, here you go. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.